I am great, grateful to be here with you all. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure. I don't care what time it is. It's, it's, uh, it's energizing for me. Uh, I'm going to share a story, a little bit about, we've talked about our dads today a little bit. And the story I'd like to share is, is my dad's example. Um, I didn't have a lot of trials as, as a child. I did have one big one. At six years old, my mother left and left six children with my father in the 60s. He had to be a single dad, which was unheard of at the time. So my dad was, uh, was an example to me in a way that has molded my life. Uh, we were very poor. My dad was a barber. He made $1.35 per haircut. If you can imagine that, $1.35 per haircut, and he was raising six kids with it. We went to private school. My dad worked out some sort of a deal with the Catholic Church that he only had to pay for one of his kids, and all the rest got to go for free. And so he was pretty resourceful. Uh, my dad was a loving, kind man, and he gave me my strength. And I'm a very strong person because of the way I saw him handle my mom leaving and leaving him in this situation. I never heard him complain. When I was, well, I was six when mom left and I became the woman of the house. I was the oldest daughter. I had uh, two younger sisters. The youngest in the family was a year and a half. And I had to be the matriarch of the family for a time and it, it, when you're a little kid that it's hard to even understand what that is but I had the responsibilities of, of what a matriarch would do I was the comforter I was the one that taught the kids the things they need to be taught especially the younger ones even my older brothers I ended up having to teach them a few things um when I was 12 years old I started doing humanitarian work it was like Again, my we were very, very poor. We didn't have anything, but we didn't know it. We didn't have any money. We didn't have stuff, but we didn't know we were poor because we had so much richness in our lives. We had each other. We loved each other. We were great siblings. And we had this man who allowed us to know our mother, even though she took off. He made sure that we got to know her. So when I was 12 years old, uh, there was a neighbor lady that needed help, and I became uh, her caretaker. I would go over after school, and I would help her do things and, and do things for her in her house, clean and make her meals and stuff. And that was my very first experience at really becoming a humanitarian. And my life has been that all the way. I have never really had a really good paying job. I have never, I am 68 years old, about to retire from a job that I don't have any retirement from and um, don't have any, I'm going to end up living on social security, which is tragic in the United States, but I'm a rich woman. I am rich because I have, I do have 15 children between me and my husband. I married a man with 11 children. I'm not the crazy one. He is. And we have so much uh, support and my husband has Alzheimer's. So I am at a turning point in my life where I'm going to switch the switch things around. I'm going to sell my house and we're going to move in with the kids so that I can continue working on some of the humanitarian work I do in my early twenties. I was a hairdresser and I, I got to work. I had the opportunity and I tell you, it was a huge opportunity to work for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. I would drive from about 100 miles every Monday um, and work in their main office. And I became their, um, I, because I was a hairdresser, they wanted me to do something where I could organize a style-a-thon. So I, it took me almost a year to, make the or, to organize it. I organized all the hairdressers in Southern California to do a style -a in their salons on a Monday when they were normally closed and all the proceeds would go to St. Jude's. I got Vidal Sassoon and Paul Mitchell to come on the telethon. I don't know if you guys know who Danny Thomas is, but he was the one that ran the, 
the telethons and I, I first started the first year I was there, I would, um, I would be, I was on the telethons. I was the one that taught the celebrities how to take the pledges. And so I had the opportunity to, to meet a lot of celebrities and, and I got to see the side of them that was the best. When people are somewhere that they're able to serve someone else, they show their good spirit. And we all have good spirits. And I always got to see that. Um, I could go on and on about all the names. I, one thing I'll tell you is my very favorite experience was a couple of years later, as I'd been working there quite a while, I got to have dinner with Sammy Davis Jr. at the big, uh, the big, uh, it was a black tie dinner. And so uh, that was my, one of the highlights. Um, I was able to, on the, la the telethon, the year that we did the Stalathon, I was able to cut hair on stage with Fidel Sassoon and Paul Mitchell, which are two famous hairdressers in the United States. And uh, I, you know, I was just this, I really wasn't a famous hairdresser, but I got to be with them. It was really fun. We earned $1 million for St. Jude's in that Stalathon. And they dedicated one wing of the hospital to the hairdressers of Southern California, of which I was invited to go to for the dedication, but I was eight months pregnant with my third child and my doctor wouldn't allow me to go. But someday I'm gonna go and I'm gonna see the plaque that says, you know, that we earned that money. I then went on to, um, I, I'm, I'm a hands-on kind of a person. I like to do things that are that that involves other people. So I was asked to do um, I was asked to do a humanitarian project where we made infant kits for babies in other countries. Um, a lot of the countries that don't have good hospitals don't have uh, women. Well, it's I'll tell you about my most recent experience. I made, I did that project that year. I had three weeks to organize a thousand infant kits and three weeks, I, I actually gathered enough people and enough, enough stuff to do a thousand kits. Then I had a year to, we, we sewed everything the second year. We made everything from scratch. The nightgowns, the blankets, the, the only thing we didn't make by um, was the, Diapers, we bought the diapers because they were cloth diapers. And each kit had um, all the essentials for a newborn. So the next year we did a thousand kits and then I moved. And then um, then I, I had been sewing blankets for, uh, I worked at, I'm a sign language interpreter. I worked at the high school and the, the deaf kids at the high school had to do a humanitarian project or service work in order to graduate. So I organized all the kids to make quilts for the elderly. The, and there's a, a home near us that's all deaf adults. And some of our deaf kids didn't even know elderly deaf people. So we would go to school every day and we would make quilts. And it was just like for one hour a day, we worked on the quilts. I need to tell you about this one young man. There was a young man, there was a classroom right next door to us. And he, they were the SED kids, the severely emotionally disturbed kids. And you know, I never knew what their issues were. I just knew there were the kids in the classroom next door. We interacted with them quite a bit. Um, they took some classes with us. Um, I was a sign language interpreter, so I would go out and mainstream in the classroom with the other kid, the deaf kids. Well, this one day, um, the teacher from that class brought this very tall boy. He probably weighed 220 pounds or so. Uh, over to me and she said, Jerry, David needs to do, he may, uh, do uh, service work in order to graduate. Can you teach him how to do this? I said, sure. David had not spoken since the day he started school. I didn't know why he didn't speak. I didn't know what had happened in his life. I, I was not privy to any information. Well, I sat this big giant kid down and I start, started teaching him how to sew. And he, he was, after just a day or two, 
he started talking a little bit. I mean, not conversation. He would just answer. I would ask him a question. My, I'd explain something to him and he responded. They were kind of surprised about that. And then one day um, I taught him how to cut the fabric and he really liked cutting the fabric. So I had been absent one day. When I came back the next day after being absent, he had but cut enough fabric for five quilts. So each of the kids did make one quilt and David made five. <laughs> he loved doing it so much. Well, he, by the time we got to the point where he was done with the fifth quilt, he was talking to me quite a bit. Then one day he had all this fabric left over and I said, you know what, David, when we get done with this last quilt, we'll go ahead and make some hot pads for your mom. And I, you know, he didn't say anything. And I, you know, the next thing I know, I'm being pulled into the next classroom by the teacher saying, Jerry, do you know why David's in the SED program? And I said, no. He says, David watched his mother commit suicide. And I had just told him, we we're gonna make her hot pads. I'm sorry, I mean, well, I haven't been emotional about that for a long time. But David didn't, didn't take it bad. He and I became really close. Two weeks after he finally was time for graduation, he went down and took his driver's test. And I was the first person he told me he passed the test. At his graduation, his dad came up to me and told me, Jerry, I don't know what you did to my son, but you brought him back. I said, I didn't do anything. He did. He served other people. He had never even met a deaf adult. He wasn't even deaf. So the day we went to deliver the quilts, David was very happy to get to give his quilts out to the people in the, in the convalescent home. Um, that made a huge impact on me. And, and um, I don't know how much time I have left. I have, I have several other, I'm, I went on a humanitarian mission with JetBlue to El Salvador. And again, I didn't wanna go empty handed. It took me two years to get permission to go with this group. So I called all my friends, we came over my house, we all sat around my pool table and we made 83 quilts. And we took them to, <coughs> the, to um, El Salvador. And I was, they were for the pregnant women. I was gonna give them to the pregnant women. I couldn't find them. So I was so excited to find pregnant women and every village we went to, we went to this one uh, orphanage. I gave one of the quilts to all the children. All the children in the orphanage were HIV positive or they had AIDS. And so I had made special little labels that we could write their names on it so that they, when they left the home, they could take the quilt with them. And this was really an amazing experience. Well, by the end of the week, I still had more quilts left that I didn't, because I didn't find very many pregnant women. And we were at the last school that we had gone to. And I said, I just don't, where are the pregnant women? And this gentleman says to me, there's a building over there and that's where they are. And it was a clinic that they had built. And these women that lived in cardboard boxes or in what they called microwave villages. These were homeless people that lived all in these makeshift houses out of cardboard. When they got to the point where they were 10 weeks out from their, their birth, they were allowed to come to the pregnancy clinic. They were taught to lactate. They were taught to how to take care of their babies. They were given medical care. They got to sleep in a comfortable bed for the last 10 weeks of their pregnancy. Then they got to deliver in a hospital. And then on at the end of that, when they brought the baby back, they stayed there till the baby was strong enough to live in a cardboard box. Infant fatality rate went from 50% down to five because of these clinics. So I asked, what can I possibly do to help you? And they asked me to make them infant kits. Well, I just happened to know how to make those. So I committed to make a thousand. Getcha will probably get a kick out of the fact that I committed to make a thousand because that seems to be my magic number. <laughs> but I committed to make a thousand. When I came home, this is how I met my 
my husband, I talked him in to help me organize this uh, humanitarian project and we made those thousand. The very last part of it, we, we sent over 650 kits right away and then 350 kits went down to Mexico. So I went down to Mexico and I was in the hospital and they had, we were in the, prim, in the, in the uh, maternity ward. And I walked up to this young girl and she had a, her baby in a disposable diaper and the baby was wrapped in a plastic bed pad. You know, those blue pads they put on the bed so you don't wet it. She had no clothes for her baby. I had brought infant kits. I had brought blankets that we had made. I was shaking. I, I, I just couldn't believe she was leaving the hospital the next day. She had nothing. So I, I ran out and I, I'm pulling out kits. I'm pulling out stuff and I'm to give to her so that she wouldn't walk out of that hospital the next day and live on the streets of Mexico with nothing for that baby. I can't even tell you how much joy this work gives me. It makes me feel rich. I don't care if I don't have money. I have children and I have very supportive family. I love my life. And so I am, and there's lots more and I know I'm out of time. So um, if you wanna know more, you just have to ask a question. And that's my story today.